How's everybody doing? Thank you for uh, taking the time to join in today. I'm Eli Nyberger. I'm the Associate Director for IT and Production at the Ann Arbor District Library. And uh, we're going to talk today about finding a legal comfort zone on the web, which of course means we have to start off with a couple of disclaimers. Um, I am not remotely an attorney. I'm not even a librarian. Uh, number two, I am double especially not your attorney, and none of the following is anything remotely like legal advice. And notwithstanding the other three, any resemblance between the cats you're about to see and real individuals, either living or dead, is purely coincidental. So don't get hung up or think I'm, I'm actually a dog person. I don't know any of these cats. So... Uh, let's talk first about ownership, copyright, and liability. And to help us find our legal comfort zone on the web, of course, we are going to use someone who makes librarians feel pretty comfortable generally, and that's our friendly cat. And this is Librarian Cat, and she wants to do the right things for her community. She wants her library to thrive in the 21st century. She wants it to be as important of a part of 21st century lives as it was to 20th century lives. And she thinks she has a plan on how to do that. And here's her plan. We'd like to invite the public to post comments, tags, ratings, and reviews on our website to engage them and get as much information from our community as possible. Our community doesn't care what Amazon thinks about a book. They want to know what our community thinks about a book. So this is what we'd like to do it. Unfortunately, as we all know, in order to make this happen, she has to go through city legal counsel cat. And uh, the attorney cat here who works for the city or the county or campus or, you know, for the library, he has his own ideas about what the library should and should not be doing. And he will usually ask questions something like this. No way the city doesn't need to take on that kind of liability, which isn't even a question. So when you're trying to make these things happen, often uh, a cat like this is one of your primary objectives. And we'll talk more about this as we go. But first, we're going to see what the other cats involved have to say. And of course, this is trite, but boy, isn't it fun. Um, so we talked to middle manager cat at the library and middle manager cat says, we don't have the staff time to moderate all those horrible comments. He knows exactly what's going to happen. You're going to put up the website and all of a sudden someone's going to be writing dirty words on all the children's books. How would we ever possibly have the staff time to be able to handle all of that? So you can see middle manager cat very concerned. Uh, then you have to deal with board member or commissioner cat, perhaps, or some other sort of governing body cat. And he has a very simple question. Why would we allow web people to comment on our website? Have you seen the newspaper? Of course, newspaper websites are famous, wretched hives of scum and villainy. And then he has to say, what do you mean, what newspaper? He is, he's concerned about the world that he knew, and you need to find a way for him to understand that the needs that you're looking to meet are f coming from the community. It's not just something that we think that they want to have. And of course, then we've got Paranoid Delusional Cat, who is kind of a, a fixture at most libraries. And, you know, while, while you don't necessarily want to write your policies to make Paranoid Delusional Cat happy, the fact is the Paranoid Delusional Cat has some very good questions. And if you launch this system where people can write reviews, she immediately jumps to, but then the FBI will know what books I like. She's worried about her privacy. And really, this may be a holdover, but it also may be something that people are going to come back to. You know, we're in a very Wild West age of privacy on the web right now, and I would suspect that a pendulum is going to start swinging back the other way at some point, or maybe it's just going to keep going. So with all those people's consideration in mind, or all those cats, I suppose, uh, Librarian Cat has to make the case. And she says community conversations are happening online. The library is a natural center of a community's public discussion. This isn't something new for us. This is something we've always been doing. Now it's happening online. We have to let it happen online at the library, too. So one of the things that you can say to Attorney Cat is, are we really taking on new risk? Many times, the risk that they're looking to avoid is risk that you're already bearing in other places. It's just now it's on the web, and it seems like it's different, but it isn't really different. For example, are we any more liable for something horrible that someone says in a comment on a blog post than we would be liable for something horrible that someone says by spray painting it on the outside of the library? Those are both public surfaces. Sure, we don't like it when someone spray paints something horrible and racist on the, the side of the library, but we're not responsible for what it says because they're using a public forum, one that we would prefer they didn't use, but it's a public forum. And there's, this is not a concern for libraries, even though many cases, the, the attorneys who you're working with might not look at it this way. So it's really important to always ask that question. Are we really taking on new risk or is this risk we're already bearing simply by being a public organization? 
For the middle managers, you can reassure them with the right tools, the moderation workload will be manageable. Moderation can be manageable. You have to do it right, and moderation takes time and experience, but with the right tools, it can be a very cost-effective and time-effective thing to do, and the catch then becomes, who's providing your tools? If there's a tool that you really need to be able to do the moderation, are you in charge of your website, or are you waiting for the vendor to develop that tool, and how long might you be waiting? For board member cats, sometimes you just need to say things like library websites are not newspaper websites and set in context the fact that newspaper websites with their just dreadful comment threads, that's what their intention is. They want page views. They want people coming to those page. The fact that newspapers and news outlets are primarily about controversy is certainly not new to the 21st century. The difference is it's easier than ever to see what people are saying about these things. But the difference is on a library website, you're almost never being a magnet for controversy, quite the reverse. And in our experience with years and years of doing this, it just doesn't happen the way that it happens on newspaper websites. The other thing that you can tell, and this is kind of important when you're dealing with paranoid delusional cat or even reasonable delusional cat or delusional reasonable paranoid cat or any one of those, they need to have the choice to not have to leave a trail. And of course, that's always a difficult thing to communicate to a cat that you don't want them to leave a trail. But the, uh, the reality is that you should be putting your patrons in control of their data and what's kept and, and what isn't. And that can be tricky, especially with many of our ILSs that really don't take that kind of thing into fact. So for this situation where you're dealing with who owns these comments, who's responsible for these comments, where's the copyright held on these comments, all that kind of stuff, what is the worst case scenario? Well, it's not too hard to imagine what the worst case scenario is on a comment thread. Someone really unhinged gets on there and just says all kinds of horrible, terrible, awful stuff, just like they do on the, on the newspaper websites. But the thing is, it's really easy to deal with that. All you got to do is say, we're going to visibly edit that. Thanks for your contribution. Take out the really ugly stuff, but make a note to the entire public in that comment that this comment has been edited for publication and thank our nice, deranged, unhinged commenter cat for making such a contribution to the library. It's really important that any moderation is transparent. That's one of the keys to a successful online community. So when you moderate, you should be encouraged to moderate when someone says something that's over the line. Of course, where's the line? You got to figure out where the line is. But when someone says something over the line, you should asterisk out the nastiest parts. One thing what we used to do with the teen gamers is when they would get a little unhinged in some of the comment threads, I would replace any of the words that I would prefer they didn't use with the word snork. So I, it was called snorking. Your post has been snorked. And of course, what was the first thing that happened? They started snorking themselves and snork became an epithet and that worked out beautifully. So you can do those kinds of tricks as well. But it's important to let people have their say, edit it for publication and make it clear that you've edited it. The real risk is that the youth of today is going, this is the real worst case scenario, is that the 21st century natives are going to look at the library website and say, pfft. This sucks. Why would this ever possibly have any meaning to my life? So while it seems like the worst case scenario is that the unhinged commenter would seize control, the real worst case scenario is that your library could be completely and totally irrelevant to the future. Now, the best case scenario is sometimes when you open up these opportunities, you know, our wonderful patrons who we love so much and give so much to the library start getting involved. I've just tagged and reviewed all the mysteries and reviewed all your Darciana, And she's looking through all the other collections for other things that she can comment on. She says, oh, my goodness, what is this old newspaper article that the library's put on the web? I think that's my grandpa. It's grandpa. Look at this, kids. And the kids come along and say, hey, this is awesome. That's a good opportunity to try to get these things changed around. Now, of course, it's not every kid who's going to look at a picture of old grandpa and say, this is awesome. But to connect their lives to the world through the web and the library is a way to provide value to an audience that may never care about checking anything out ever. So let's move on to another category here, responsibility and privacy. And this is getting progressively stickier as the social media is putting downward pressure on the privacy threshold in our society. So as our patrons become more interested in sharing their data and tracking their actions becomes easier, we need a balanced policy approach to make sure that our users stay in control of their own data, and yet we have what we need for when there's a problem or for when we want to have answers about our own use. So of course you take this to, to a city legal counsel cat and he says, wait, since when are we letting your borrower delete their records you know he just he doesn't know anything about libraries it's not his job to know anything about libraries all he worries about is compliance and lawsuit exposure and those two things are kind of difficult when you get wrapped up in patrons choosing to expose their personal information of course, middle manager cat is kind of on the other side of this. He's like, Google Analytics can tell us everything we ever wanted to know. All you got to do is put this little piece of code on every page of our website, and then we have all this wonderful use data, and we can see all kinds of stuff, and we can find efficiencies, and we can decide who's best on what, and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, there's some pitfalls to that. We'll get that to that in just a minute. Now, of course, 
library commission cat might say something like, oh, this is easy. Just don't keep any records. That way we can protect their privacy completely. You won't have any that we might abuse. We won't have anything that someone might steal. And there's no information when the man comes knocking. And of course, this is, this is of course, Paranoid Cat's worst nightmare. When the man comes asking, please don't let him know I checked this out. It's important. There's a book for, for whatever reason, Paranoid Cat thinks that the FBI is determined to find out if she has read this or not. So she, what are you going to do in this sort of situation? How can you reassure her what things will or will not be done? Well, you know, we need to set a high, pri a high standard for privacy and clear control. Caring about privacy may be the only differentiator that libraries have left on the web. It's abundantly clear to users that Facebook really doesn't care about this stuff, really doesn't give a cat turd about any of this stuff. And, uh, you know, other networks are doing marginally better. So can the library be the standard bearer for privacy on the web? And if anything, the library's probably held to a higher standard. But we need to make sure that our users always have control of their data. So again, your question for the city attorney is, are we really taking on new risk? Is storing a user's checkout history when they choose to store it any riskier than the fact that that vendor you subcontracted to subcontract to pay off the water bills is storing their credit cards? Are you sure that they're adhering to your compliance policies? Is there risk that you're already facing that's much more risky than what we're already doing here? The other question is to make sure that middle manager CAD understands that as nice as Google Analytics and other tools might be, we need to keep control of access to our data, which means that if someone wants to know something about something that our patrons have done, they have to ask us about it. We need to keep make sure that there's not a third party that can grant those requests. The other thing is sometimes library commissioner CAT just, just needs to understand that this is something patrons are asking for. Some patrons want to opt in to storing all their checkouts, and believe it or not, some want to share their entire checkout history with the entire world, even with their name on it. That's a generation gap. It's a hard thing to understand, and sometimes you can see from his face he's not too interested in hearing about some of these things. But the reality is that this is demand from the public. This is the things they're able to do other places on the web, and when libraries aren't feature compat com competitive with those other services, we do so at our own peril. And of course, the most important thing to say to Paranoid Cat is that we won't divulge your information without a court order. Now, of course, what we're saying here is we will divulge your information with a court order. So Paranoid Cat, make sure you're not keeping any information here that you don't want someone else to see if they come after you with a court order, as you're sure that they someday will. So what's the worst case scenario in this, in this situation? Well, the worst case scenario is when the man does come and the, the guy in the suit with the earpiece comes up to the, to the uh, desk and says, I'm Agent Katz, cheap joke. What can you tell us about this library user? And of course, there's one response. And if you're not the director, the first response is, let me put you in touch with the library director. But if you are the director, your response is, we'd be happy to release that information to you in response to a court order. You got to go through the channel so that everyone is on board with this. Now, of course, what's going to happen when you say that? He's just going to go to his friend Googs and say, hey, Googs, has this cat ever looked at this book? And because you put Google Analytics code on every one of your pages, the Google knows. And he looks at his logs. And he says, totally like a bazillion times. And, you know, that is all the information that's needed. So we have to be aware that, that, that piping our data through external services, as helpful as it may be, means that we no longer can be assured that we have control over who has access to that data, meaning that our privacy standards that we fought so hard to establish may be irrelevant. So, and that's not a good situation to be in. So what's the best case scenario here? The best case scenario is when you have a serious cat who thinks about serious stuff and he can look at the way the library is treating this and say, I take this stuff seriously and I know the library does too. The library is going to keep my information safe and I'm willing to give them some of my personal information because I know they're going to keep it safe. So do you want to post this photo of grandpa's birthday party or not? The immediate thing where some of this stuff goes is that um, the line between history and uh, and, and what just happened is a pretty thin one. I mean, we tend to treat, you know, if a library is responsible for archiving the history of its, organ of its community in some ways, uh, you know, history is anything that just happened. So, so long as they took this picture in the past and not the future, hey, that's local history. Sure, we'll take your picture of Grandpa's birthday party. Let's uh, tag it with his name and his career and, and uh, where he's lived and see what else happens. The other thing is that ideally, Paranoid Cat is, has the opinion that the library tells her what she needs to know to keep her secrets safe. We're not challenging that they're secrets. We're not challenging for whatever reason she's worried that someone's going to say it. We just tell her what she needs to know to keep them safe. And one of them might be, hey, if you really have got to read Garfield Goes Bananas and you're worried that someone might know that you checked it out, maybe you just want to read it in the library and then put it back on the shelf. That's the best way to be sure. So let's talk quickly about licensing in terms of use. 
So this gets to be kind of a tricky thing because there's two ways that this go. The first is when the library is agreeing to someone else's license, which we all do generally hundreds of times a day. The other is when the library wants to license things from people who want to give them to it. So for example, if you're doing a digitization project, you need to get the license, the permission from the copyright holder to be able to put that stuff online unless it's in the public domain. So uh, this is the librarian cat's position on this. We're entering into increasingly complex license agreements and trying to obtain clearance for digitization projects. And we need a progressive IP stance. And of course, yeah, what is what is a... Uh what does attorney cat have to be interested in that? He just says, I need at least six weeks to review each end user license agreement you want accepted. Even on a printer driver, dude, you want us to ch wait six weeks before we install the printer driver while you send out this user license agreement? How many times did you click I agree this week? So the other thing is that sometimes your middle managers who might be working with vendors might bring you something a little bit of a bombshell. I just realized something kind of weird about this license agreement. Like for example, maybe it expired two years ago and nobody ever renewed it. So part of it is you have to be on top of the license agreements that we sign into for others. The other part is that there's a very sharp line between 20th century uh, copyright attitudes and 21st century copyright attitudes. And board commissioner Cat might just as easily say, oh, this is really easy. Everything we take from anyone, we should just copyright it and then not let anyone ever use it. That way we'll be sure that it keeps safe. Well, obviously that's not really quite getting to our mission. The other thing is you might have someone in your community who has something that they either have the copyright to and they can grant to you or hold something in the public domain that they're willing to donate to you that you could digitize. And they say, I want to give these documents to the library, but not if they won't protect them. And of course, protect could have any one of a number of different uses. Are they talking about DRM? What are they talking about? Who knows? Well, what we need to do is develop formal progressive agreements with users or partners who want to contribute material to our digital collections. And we also need to be on top of the agreements that we sign with others. And again, it's the same question here. Are we really taking on new risk? But the thing is, you can be taking on new risk if a contributor doesn't indemnify you against damages because a library typically has deeper pockets than the person who has something in their shoebox. And something can become an infringement target when a library posts it that it wouldn't otherwise have been. Which means in many cases, Attorney Cat, for good reason, is going to want you to have someone who donates something to the library to indemnify you against copyright action, including attorney's fees, which means if anything ever happens, they're on the hook for it and not us, so that it is no more attractive to sue because of copyright infringement of something a library posts now that the library's holding it versus the original holder. The other part is you just need to say to Mental Manager Cat, look, we cannot trust the vendors to be on top of our end of their agreements. That's our job. That's our work. You can also help to explain Creative Commons licensing, which is really the perfect situation for libraries. Using Creative Commons licensing is a perfect fit for libraries where uh, protects the uses we want to protect and prevents the uses that we're trying to prevent. The other part is when someone comes to you with a document, you want to have an agreement that is ready to go, a content agreement that says, here it is, take a look, let us know if you have any concerns. That's the, the way to be ready to take advantage. So what's the worst case? The worst case is that she's going to say, my brother, the attorney, says I shouldn't sign this because it would involve her basically indemnifying the library. That's one approach that city attorney cat is going to be happy with. Well, sometimes it doesn't have to end. They can try scratching out that part. Cats are good at scratching out parts of contracts. We can ask them to take out the part that they have objection to and see where we go with it because that can be a real loss. But at the same time, if, if we don't get that indemnification, the city attorney is probably not going to let it happen. The best case is that young young uh, 21st century hoodlum cat is going to is going to all of a sudden discover that the library has things that can help him do what he's trying to do and that he can use this thing in his report and that even he can even discover things about his own town that he never knew that this is my community here's reasons to be proud of my community and I learned about it at the library so the other just a final little other tote about this is that you know for 20, for the, the, the immigrants to the 21st century, or the sort of like the, uh, the uh, second generation, the hipsters who understand a lot of this stuff and think a lot about IP issues, and it's going to be one of the defining political moments of their lives as time goes on, for them to see the library embracing Creative Commons sends them a really strong message that the, re the library really knows what's going on with this stuff and is taking a progressive stance and is going to protect the community information. So to wrap up, Legal fretting usually masks other discomfort, and if you can find that discomfort and address it, sometimes the legal worries can fall along the wayside. For Attorney Cat, it's his job to minimize the risk, but in many cases you can find that existing risk that contains your project risk and make it clear that what you want to do does not really involve new risk for the city. 
For middle management, they have a very simple set of requirements. They want things to be manageable. If management knows that the change will be manageable, then they're happy and everything will be okay. They just have to have some assurance that it's going to be a manageable change. Managers love management. The other part is that sometimes the boards or commissions need to be shown how the change that we're pursuing is in pursuit of user needs. It's not just, hey, we think it would be cool. It's not, hey, this other library is doing this. It's not, hey, this would be shiny. It's that our users need this, and they're telling us that they need it, and this is how we can make it happen. The other part is that the paranoid do need to know that we take them seriously and that we keep them in control of their data, and that's a good stance for ev all library users, not just the freaked out ones. And most importantly, this is more important than anything else, the library needs to be valued by the children of the 21st century. And that's not easy because they could have a really rich and fulfilling life with all the content they ever want and never get any of it from the library. We need to realize that the only thing standing between a kid who's comfortable on the web and everything they ever wanted is time. There are legal restrictions, but if they can put in enough time, they can find the movie, the CD, even the book that they're looking for, for no money, without any library card, without any, without any of that stuff. So that's what I've got to say for today. Thanks very much for listening, and good luck.